I would like to get started by introducing our first speaker. And I'll keep the introductions fairly brief. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Ken Cameron, who is a professor of botany at the University of Wisconsin and director of the Wisconsin State Herbarium. His primary research interests focus on systematics, evolution, structure, and conservation of orchids based on integrated studies that are carried out in the field, in the herbarium, and in the laboratory, along with uh, extensive exploration of published literature. He is himself a specialist in the orchid subfamily Veniloidae, which is an ancient group that includes the only orchid of agricultural value, vanilla, and is pivotal to the study of orchid evolution. And um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Ken to kick us off. Thank you, Ron, and thanks to so many people from around the world for joining us today to talk about an important topic, which is orchid conservation. Um, the OCA does such amazing work, and it's really an honor for me to be here sharing a little bit of my, my own personal research. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Ron, can you see that? Yes, that looks great. Okay, great. So the, um, the topic of my talk this morning uh, is orchid conservation, the impact of climate change on a regional flora. And that regional flora happens to be my home state of Wisconsin. Um, and I'll explain why it's an important area to consider uh, from the perspective of, of orchid conservation. Uh, just a couple of things. Ron mentioned that I'm a professor in, of botany. I'm also the director of a large herbarium of about 1.3 million pressed and dried plant specimens. But more recently, I've become the chair of our conservation biology major at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. That's a program that was started by Aldo Leopold, the father of conservation biology back in the 1950s. And I'm really happy to report that we now have over 200 undergraduates who have declared conservation biology as their major. And this is one of the fastest and largest growing majors on the campus, which gives me a lot of hope about the future. So some of you have probably heard me give talks before to orchid societies or different orchid conferences. Um, I consider myself a plant systematist, a person who studies taxonomy and evolution, diversity, uh, especially of orchids. And these are some of the orchids that I and my students have studied over the uh, last 30 years of my career. I've never really thought of myself so much as a, a conservation biologist, um, but more and more I, I, I am starting to um, realize the importance that I can have in that particular arena. And um, in particular, I'd say that um, this report published in 2019 by the United Nations um, really touched me. Uh, it's a very long and detailed report. Um, and I read this to the conservation biology majors during their uh, commencement in 2019. And I'll just highlight the most important finding in blue there the report finds that about 1 million animal and plant species are, are now threatened with extinction, many within decades and more than ever before in human history. A very depressing statement, which um, has become even more um, depressing in recent years. Uh, this study, th this article that was published in The Guardian uh, just last week uh, mentioned that um, new information has become available increasing that number to 2 million uh, species that are now at risk of extinction. And as this article, uh, you've probably seen this in, in headlines and across social media, uh, the main reason that that number doubled has to do with the fact that insects have now been assessed for their vulnerability. Um, and I, this is an important point to make. Uh, I'm going to be contrasting the difference between species richness, the total numbers of species that are vulnerable, versus evolutionary lineages or phylogenetic diversity. So although this number has doubled um, in terms of the numbers of species, uh, it's because of one single evolutionary lineage, the insects. Um, I'll also just share this quote from Sir David Attenborough that uh, was published after the World Biodiversity Summit in Glasgow uh, in 2021, where he said that it's surely our responsibility to do everything within our power to create a planet that provides a home, not just for us, but for all life on earth. And it's with those 
data and those sentiments that my colleagues and I at the University of Wisconsin in Madison applied to the National Science Foundation for a program called Dimensions of Biodiversity. And we were successful at securing a large grant. Um, and um, the beauty of this particular project was that it included both plant ecologists as well as plant systematists. My colleagues, Don Waller and Tom Givnish are both well-known plant ecologists and myself and Ken Seitzma are both plant systematists. And so with this integrated viewpoint of biodiversity, using Wisconsin as a model system, um, we've been able to address past, present, and future impacts of climate change on biodiversity. So I'm gonna start out with a very simple question that I think we'll all answer the same way. Is it important to protect areas of high biodiversity? Well, of course it is. If yes, then what data should we use to prioritize areas to protect over others? The truth is we're just not going to be able to save everything and every place that's in danger. So how will we prioritize? How will we allocate our limited resources? And, and more fundamentally, how do we even measure biodiversity? I think we all know what it means, but how as a scientist can I be quantitative and, and more objective in measuring that? So I, I often give this talk to local orchid societies and I ask them, uh, I give them kind of a hypothetical scenario. Imagine that your society has limited amounts of, of resources, of funding and, and manpower, volunteers, uh, but you want to help conserve a 10 acre parcel of land in your area. Well, given these two options, site A or site B, which one would you choose? I think almost all of us would raise our hands and say that something about site B looks like it's more biodiverse. It has nine species of orchids, in six different genera compared to four species in four genera. So I think we'd all agree that site B deserves more protection if we had to prioritize. Well, what if we changed that um, and asked whether site B or site C with nine species, same number of species, but this time in seven genera? Well, most of my audience would raise their hand and say site C as in cat. Uh, there just seems to be something more diverse about seven genera versus six, even if the total numbers of species are the same. And then finally, um, compare that nine species in seven genera at site Z or site D, as in dog. Now we've dropped to only seven species, but also seven genera. Well, again, most of my audience would probably raise their hand and say site C, as in cat. Nine species, that sounds more biodiverse. But I'm telling you that personally, as an evolutionary biologist, I would probably prioritize site D. Yes, it has lower numbers of species uh, or lower species richness, but it actually has higher phylogenetic diversity. What that means is that it captures more evolutionary history or more branches of the tree of life. Because although seven species in seven genera, they come from seven different tribes of the orchid family and four of the five orchid subfamilies. So from an evolutionary perspective, this is uh, more diverse. We will talk about phylogenetic diversity or PD throughout this talk. And the contrast between these two measurements, species richness, total numbers of species, versus phylogenetic diversity is being used and embraced by a lot of conservation biologists, not just for orchids, not just for plants, but for many different organisms, including in this case, glass frogs in South America, where these researchers have mapped and contrasted richness, panel A to phylogenetic, or B to phylogenetic diversity and C, and then compared that to the areas that actually are protected we would like to see overlap in all of those. And unfortunately, we often do not see that we're protecting the areas of greatest diversity. Now, if this concept is a little bit unclear to you or still doesn't quite make sense, um, I'm gonna use an example based on humans just because I think we can relate to this uh, more easily. Um, the way in which we measure phylogenetic diversity or the branches of the tree of life is to build 
an evolutionary tree. Um, in this case, this is one species representing different populations of humans. And all we really have to do is trace the lines, the branches between different groups. So for example, in my uh, tree here, uh, the difference between a Korean person and a Japanese person marked in red is a very small genetic distance. But the difference between an Ethiopian individual up at the top, tracing that green line all the way down to a Polynesian individual um, would be much larger. They, they are genetically uh, more distant than a Korean and a Japanese. And we can quantify this then with numbers um, using genetic distances based on DNA sequences. So in our hypothetical examples with orchids, um, number one, let, let's say we sequence the DNA from five different um, orchids that are found at this site. You can see the little hypothetical tree there with numbers representing genetic mutations or distances. And orchid site one, we would calculate to have a phylogenetic diversity of 43. We total up all the numbers. If orchid site two is missing one of those species, we simply subtract its genetic value. So it's 42 rather than 43. And in orchid site three, we might be missing also just one species, but this one has a value of five genetic units. So it, it's the total gen phylogenetic diversity of orchid site three is only 38 because we've lost uh, individual D, which is sort of more valuable down there at the bottom of my slide. I'm suggesting species D might be more valuable than species C just because it has this longer genetic um, diversity. Now that's a controversial <laughs> statement to make. Um, I mean, really are some species more valuable than others? Many conservation biologists, and I think most of us have had it hammered into our head that all species are created equal. They're all equally valuable. We want to protect everything on earth. And, and I agree with that. If I had to make a choice, I'd save everything. But you know, facing the reality of, of the situation, uh, we may not be able to do that. So consider that there are 400,000 species of beetle but only one species of platypus. Well, I'll just go out there and you can disagree with me. I th sure think it would be a tragedy to humanity, to our planet if we lost the platypus. But if we lost one or two beetles, I guess it's not really the end of the world um, in comparison. And, and we might say the same thing about orchids. Um, you know, with apologies to the people who love pleurothalids, Mary and others, you know, there's over a thousand different species of Pleurothallus. We can afford to lose one or two of them. But my goodness, if we lose Mexipedium xerophyticum, that's a tragedy. There's only one species in that genus and we, we would lose a big chunk of the tree of life. So I do think that biologists are starting to question whether some species may actually be more valuable than others. And that leads our conservation priorities. So these, um, Two concepts, species richness on the left and down there at the bottom, phylogenetic diversity are the concepts I'd like to focus on a little bit, but I have to admit that measuring biodiversity is not easy. We also take into uh, effects such as rarity. We'd like to preserve things that are especially rare. Um, aesthetics, let's face it, we're human. Um, we love beautiful things um, and we might somehow choose to prioritize those. Cultural heritage comes into play. For example, um, those of us in the United States know that the state flower of Minnesota is the showy lady slipper. That species means a lot to those people. Um, and, and so we take into account all of these things. There's also emerging um, notions that some species are keystone species. They actually hold greater importance in holding ecosystems together than others. Uh, and, and so measuring this is not easy and making these decisions is not easy. Furthermore, let's think about climate change for a minute. What if we knew something about the past or the future of these sites? Uh, for example, I told you site one was valuable, but what if under climate change, we knew with a crystal ball that it would be reduced to just two surviving orchids, whereas site two might survive climate change 
and, and maintain the four that are there today. That would also contribute to our thoughts about which area to preserve over another. And um, the data and the results I'm going to be sharing with you this afternoon that focus on Wisconsin were part of this large team effort. And I need to give a, a really important shout out to Dr. Daniel Spalink, Spalink uh, who was, the, uh, was a graduate student and then a postdoc within our department um, who um, led most of this research that I'm about to present. And it's published in the American Journal of Botany, if you'd like to look up more of the details there with our team of, of co-authors. So now you might be asking, why are we talking about Wisconsin? I mean, after all, um, it's not necessarily known as a hotspot of orchid diversity. In fact, um, our flora in general is not terribly rich compared to the tropics or to California or Florida, for example. We only have 2,640 species of vascular plants within the flora of Wisconsin. Many of those are introduced and the numbers are increasing. Um, but we are actually quite rich in orchids um, by temperate standards. Um, within the state of Wisconsin, we have just around 40 species of orchids. And those come from 18 different genera in 11 different tribes within four of the five orchid subfamilies. So we actually are quite an interesting orchid flora. And I guess I'm making the point here that we can't only think about orchids on their own. They are part of a large flora and part of the web of life and entire ecosystems. The other reason that Wisconsin is an interesting model system is when we step back at different levels. So for example, uh, many community ecologists break the world up into biomes, very large continental scale assemblages of vegetation maybe between 15 and 17 world biomes um, across the continents. And when we zoom into North America and focus especially on Wisconsin, this is really an interesting place. Five of the world's 15 or 17 world biomes are present within our state. This is an interesting convergence area in, in the center of North America where the um, in yellow, the taiga, the boreal forests reach their southern limit in our state. The eastern um, deciduous forest comes in from the southeast. We've got the grassland biome coming in from the west. We've got savannas and mixed forests in the middle of our state. So there's almost nowhere else in North America, except maybe, maybe Minnesota, um, where all of these world biomes are converging into one common um, area. And that makes the place very interesting. That's a global scale, but we can also think about it regionally. So within the United States or within North America, we say that Wisconsin is a confluence of six regional floras. For example, the Appalachian flora comes up into our state, as does the Ozarks flora coming in from the south and overlapping. The flora of the Great Plains comes into our state and overlaps. And then the boreal zone, as I mentioned, also comes down in. So we've got this overlap. Nowhere else in this map do you see so much overlap and hatching as in Wisconsin. And furthermore, because of our interesting geologic past and topography, disjunct elements come in from the Rocky Mountains and the Eastern Coastal Plain. And all of this together creates a mosaic of different habitats and landscapes, terrestrial as well as fresh water, um, for orchids and other plants to survive. So there are good reasons that Wisconsin is being used as a model system. I would also add that we know a lot about Wisconsin's past. Um, we know a great deal about the last glacial maximum during the Pleistocene when much of uh, North America, the Northern North America was covered by ice. Um, today, those ice sheets have left behind in Wisconsin over 15,000 different lakes, incredibly fertile soil, except in the very southwest corner, which we call the driftless area. I think you can see in my topographic map here what a very different uh, rugged landscape that is. And I want you to tuck that in the back of your mind because it will come back um, in just a moment. We also know quite a bit about our uh, floristic diversity, both from a pre-European settlement perspective on the left, 
uh, a very uh, heterogeneous landscape with many different kinds of plant communities, as well as the changes that we've imposed on that landscape today uh, through urbanization, through cutting down of forests uh, for lumber industry, as and most importantly for agriculture. Everything you see in yellow is now agriculture. And I put a circle around this one area because we have very few um, historical herbarium collections from here. Within one generation of European settlement, all of that landscape was transformed before the scientists ever got a chance to document it. So I've often wondered what used to grow in this area. And I'll come back to that thought again in just a moment. One reason that we know so much about our past vegetation is thanks to this uh, scientist, John Curtis. He's sometimes called the father of plant community ecology. He was a professor at the UW-Madison. And many people don't know that he started out as an orchid biologist. He's the person who kind of cracked the code on how um, uh, um, mycorrhizal fungi and orchid seeds germinated. And he was actually hired here at Madison specifically to set up a laboratory for um, orchid propagation in order to help restore landscapes. His interest in orchids continued right on through to the end. He was a longtime member of the American Orchid Society, um, but he shifted his interests more toward um, large ecological concepts and published those in a book, The Vegetation of Wisconsin, which we still use today um, in the classroom. And what Curtis did in the 1940s and 50s was to set up um, a large number of plots, study sites across the state of Wisconsin where he surveyed all of the vegetation and all of the species and quantified their abundance and frequency. And these are his original sites that he and his students uh, sampled during that time. And my colleague Don Waller and his students have gone back now 50 years later and resampled um, more than 500 of those sites that still persist. You know, many of them have been turned into housing developments and Walmart shopping centers and so forth. But they've gone back to see what has changed in the last 50 years since Curtis and his students looked at these places. And they've come up with a list um, of North and South uh, of winners, species that are increasing in their abundance and frequency. Here's a couple plants listed. Um, and interestingly, one of them is an orchid. One of these orchids um, is actually on the increase, Epipactus helloborini. Now, those of you who are from North America know that this is not a native orchid to our continent. Um, it's indigenous to mostly Europe, but uh, Asia as well. So it's a Eurasian species. And um, some interesting work has been done to model its movement across the globe. Um, I'm going to highlight a paper here by Marta Kolonowska from Poland that she um, did some modeling, what we call um, niche modeling or species distribution modeling, taking known localities today and then um, using a lot of data from satellites and, and on the ground considering uh, precipitation and temperature and slope aspect and soil types and many different um, abiotic features, and then modeling the future distribution of, of these species. So you can see in the bottom that Marta predicted that Epipactus helebrini would start spreading across North America, especially in the Great Lakes region, which maybe the map is small on your screen, but that's a dark blue area. And eventually it's going to reach the West Coast and spread up all the way into Alaska. Um, and it is doing that. So these niche models uh, that predict the future are real. Um, and, and I'm going to show you quite a few of them in just a moment. Unfortunately, um, there are a number of species that are losing as well, that have lost um, their abundance since 1950. Many of them are shown here. And again, one of them is an orchid, Calypso bulbosa, one of our most beloved uh, North American native orchids. And a lot of effort has gone into conservation and um, trying to locate populations of this orchid in our state. Um, there was one population that was found uh, recently in 2021, and it even made a headline in the, in the newspapers around here. 
Um, and the quote from the reporter said that a new population of Calypso orchid, a state threatened plant, was found in a white cedar swamp near Crandon. But only fewer than five Calypso populations now remain in Wisconsin. It used to be much more abundant. And more importantly, dozens of surveys in recent years for this plant have failed to find any. Um, again, I'm going to make a controversial statement. Um, are we expending more resources than this plant deserves? Should we simply face the reality that this plant is on its way out, it's not going to be able to survive in Wisconsin much longer, and all of those taxpayer dollars going to fund DNR officials who are doing these hours and hours and weeks and weeks of surveys, maybe we just need to let that go and shift our priorities a little bit. And one reason I say that, of course, is because climate is changing and the landscape that used to support Calypso in Wisconsin may not be able to support that species in the future. Um, so here's a map of the United States. Um, you may know that the first Earth Day was held in 1970, right here on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And climatologists have been monitoring on a state-by-state -state basis the average annual warming uh, because it's not equal across all of the planet or even across all of my country. Um, guess which state tops the list for experiencing the highest rate of annual average temperature increase? It's Wisconsin. We tie with Delaware in first place, uh, along with a, num a number of other states from the upper Midwest and the New England area that are exper experiencing climate change at a much uh, greater rate than, than elsewhere in the country. Uh, I'll tell you that um, today it's going to be 55 degrees. It's mid-November. We usually have snow on the ground, um, and it doesn't look like we're going to have a white Christmas at all. So Wisconsin's climate is changing. We know a lot about its past, and we even know we know even more about its present flora. And that's thanks to the efforts of a number of scientists and citizen scientists who go out to document plants, including orchids, across our state. Uh, people love the outdoors here. Um, I'm the director of the state herbarium. Uh, we've only been around since 1854, um, but we have grown to be one of the largest herbaria in the world with over 1.4 million botanical specimens. And that provides us some really fantastic data along with our partners here in the state to um, begin thinking about species richness and phylogenetic diversity. In fact, we have a, a statewide consortium of different herbaria uh, listed here. And together, our team effort has digitized uh, almost 500,000, 489,000 specimen records just within our state of plants. And we've geo-referenced um, 70, almost 75% of those. We have over 362,000 geo-reference specimens. And what I mean by that is that we have gone in and precisely calculated latitude and longitude coordinates for every one of our botanical specimens going all the way back to 1854. And now we can create very precise dot maps. Um, the old maps like down in the bottom left corner were just done on a county by county basis, but now we can pinpoint with accuracy a red dot where every specimen was collected. Um, so for example, you see here um, the uh, pink lady slipper, Cypripedium acaule, one of our beloved orchids, and you can see that it's been collected in all but 17 counties. Now, the reason these data points matter is because we can both look backwards to 1950 or earlier. We can look at today, and we can also make projections for the future. This is a paper that I absolutely love. It's, it's really um, valuable information. It was done by um, a PhD student, Jeremy Ash, together with Tom Givnish and Don Waller, where they compared the average, um, they, they took the full geographic distribution of a species as it was known in 1950 during Curtis's time, and then they recalculated its, its centroid, its average center of distribution in the 2000s. 
And on the left panel with the green arrows, you can see how those centroids of species distribution have shifted in just 50 years. So those arrows are vectors. They're mostly pointing toward the north, northwest. Um, and some are longer, some are shorter than others. So the species distribution is moving. Um, and there was a big announcement this week about the USDA hardiness zones shifting more toward the northwest. Um, and that's what's happening. Climate's changing, but it's getting warmer in the north. But they also, these authors also calculated the analog of the envelope for climate and compared what was the climate in 1950 compared to the climate of 2000. And they made a vector, an, another arrow, again, mostly shifting north by northwest. And I think you can see that the red arrows are much longer than the green arrows. That results in what's known as a species lag time. In other words, the species cannot move fast enough to keep up with the climate. The climate is moving faster than the species can move. Now, if you're an animal or you know, a bird or an insect or something, you can probably keep up with it, but plants don't have that ability, um, and, and nor do fungi as much. So um, species lag time is of great concern because it may lead to extinction of species if they can't move fast enough. Okay, um, the last thing I'll highlight that is one reason that Wisconsin is a good model system is that um, in my lab with about 30 undergrad students, um, we worked really hard to extract DNA from every single species of plant native to Wisconsin, including all of our orchids. Um, and we generated a, a community phylogeny. We now have genetic information from every single species an evolutionary tree of the flora of Wisconsin. No other state has this resource and having it as a tool now allows us to incorporate those concepts that I mentioned earlier, evolutionary distance or genetic distance so that we can compare not only species richness just by making lists of species in an area, but we can also start thinking about phylogenetic diversity of those areas. Um, and how that might be telling us a different story. So we've got all this information about the past and the present, and with so much data now available, can we use models to predict Wisconsin's future? Yes, we can. We took uh, what we called a philofloristic approach. Um, this is a lot of work, again, mostly um, Daniel Spalink's efforts. From the floristics, perspective, we downloaded many different data sets representing bioclimate um, and soil data. We took those 300,000 or more herbarium species occurrence records that had all been georeferenced. These represented all the vascular plants of Wisconsin, and we built individual species distribution models for every species, those, those niche models like Marta had done for Epipactus. So for example, here's um, a map and the dark, the blue shading shows you the area, the, the potential area that a species could grow within. Now it doesn't mean it grows in every single one of these places, but this is the niche, the environmental niche where that species should or could occur. Um, so I don't know which one this is. Let's imagine this is um, the showy orchid, Galliaris spectabilis. We did that for every species. So that's species one, here's species two, here's species three, species four, and we went through all 2,600 species of plant in Wisconsin and generated an aggregated model for our state. So we have now a very clear understanding of richness of vascular plants across all of Wisconsin. We then combined this with the evolutionary data, the genetic tree based on two genes. Um, and then we also used models of climate change predicting into the future 50 years to, to the year 2070. Those are data from climatologists. And we know that many species are coming into our state and we can't only study Wisconsin. We have to put it in a bigger context. And so we, we expanded our matrix to be a super matrix of all Eastern North American plant species. 
which added an additional 2,300 species um, that aren't in Wisconsin yet, but could potentially move into our state. So this was a, a gigantic, massive effort looking at our entire flora. And these are the results. Um, on the left in blue is the potential species richness map. Uh, it, in other words, the darker areas, the dark blue are the areas where we should see the richest number of species in our flora. And the white or lighter colors are the poorer areas in terms of numbers of species. What I find so interesting about this is um, the dark areas, the darkest areas are through the southeast and that kind of central zone. And you may remember that I told you um, we don't have a lot of herbarium specimens from that area. That landscape was completely transformed in one generation because of the rich soils. Um, but what it tells me is it's almost like a time machine to go backwards and say, this area must have been very rich in the past. Um, and our models uh, confirm that. What's equally interesting is that when we contrasted richness to phylogenetic diversity, we saw a very different pattern. The areas to the south might have a lot of species in them, but they are not terribly diverse from an evolutionary or phylogenetic perspective. Instead, it's the northern tier of our state that has the greatest phylogenetic diversity. And this is pretty easy to understand. In the south of Wisconsin, we have a lot of prairies. Those prairies tend to be dominated by grasses and sunflowers and some sedges. Big numbers of species, but they're only coming from a handful of different families of plants. In fact, not so many orchids. When we go to the north, we have maybe fewer species, but we have honeysuckles and ferns and orchids and and um, rubiaceae and just so many different branches of the tree of life represented up north. And so it's a different way of considering the landscape. So that talks about the present. That's what we know today, um, sort of looking backwards, but also to the present. And our main question, of course, was how will climate change over the next 50 years, looking ahead to 2070, how will climate change impact, for example, species richness, overall diversity? Well, our model says that Wisconsin is going to become a much richer state. You see the present richness on the left and our prediction that 850 new species are going to move into our state, mostly from the south, the south by southeast coming up from Illinois. As our climate gets warmer, those southern species will come into our state and offer uh, future generations a much richer landscape. That sounds great, right? I mean, biodiversity, that's what we want. We want more species. But there's a flip side. Although 850 new species will come in, we will lose, we predict, 242 species by 2070 because of climate change. And the pattern is not random. We have modeled that 15% of our monocots, 28% of our ferns and lycopods, 30% of our gymnosperms, and most shockingly to, to me and to us, is that 26% of our orchids are likely to be lost in Wisconsin uh, in the future. That's really depressing, but with this information, we can actually go to our Department of Natural Resources, we can go to our conservation biologists, and we can in some ways tell them which of the species are most vulnerable, which of those 26% are most threatened. And I've high, there, there's a, a calculation called Shaner's D statistic that tells us what the distribution is today, what it will be in the future. And then we can see whether it's complete overlap, little change, or no future overlap, extinction, big change. So I just highlighted the ones in red that have um, less than 50% um, D statistic with the idea that these are the most vulnerable. Now you can take that data however you want. You can say, these are the ones we should be putting our all of our um, efforts into preserving, or you can say, these are the ones that don't have a chance. And 
we should not waste resources on them. We should just let them go. They're going to be fine in Canada. They're going to be fine in the UP of Michigan, but we should try to protect the ones that actually do have a chance of surviving in climate change. So um, to recap, I just told you that species richness is going to increase in our flora, but it will not be random. Well, what about phylogenetic diversity? Remember that that pattern it was very different. So our models um, are a little bit sad. They tell us that um, the present phylogenetic diversity, all that dark purple in the north, is going to be lost. We are going to see the, the loss of many branches of the tree of life in the northern tier of our state. And the future phylogenetic diversity model um, instead shows that only the southwest corner of Wisconsin in dark purple um, will actually be able to retain uh, more than 75 to 100% of the current flora. In other words, this area um, may actually serve as a Noah's Ark, a refuge for species in the future to be able to persist in these climate change whereas the northern part of our state is going to um, lose those branches of the tree of life. This is a, a quote that came out of our research paper, and I'm just going to read it. Um, our models suggest that Wisconsin's projected climate will be unsuitable for most species to be able to retain their present distributions throughout the state. Only 65% will be able to retain more than half of their present distributions. If these predictions hold true, then attempting to restore past or even maintain present distributions is perhaps a waste of effort. Uh -uh. That's a really depressing thought for, for conservation biologists. Um, and I certainly don't want to leave us on a depressing thought. So instead, I do want to draw your attention again to this southwest corner. If this area in 2070 will be the most phylogenetically diverse or richest area of the state, it corresponds to that driftless area that I mentioned. The only part of, of Wisconsin that was not covered by glaciers, it's a spectacular uh, area um, with great topography and lots of rare species and many different um, climate niches. And the reason I've become so interested in this area of late is because there seems to be some growing evidence that it's in the past acted as a northern glacial refugium. So even at the height of the, of the different ice ages uh, of the Pleistocene, different ice sheets surrounded the driftless area, but it was never covered by ice. So it could have served as a past sink of biodiversity a place where species hung out. After the ice retreated, it became a source for those organisms to recolonize the glaciated landscape. And what we're telling people is that it actually may be a future sink under climate change. And I'm talking to our DNR biologists and other landowners telling them, if we wanna conserve our biodiversity into the future under climate change, we really need to protect these areas. And I think that holds true around the world. Identifying these past glacial refugia may actually hold the key to um, essentially creating a Noah's Ark for biodiversity um, into the future. So I'll, I'll go back to that United Nations report that I started uh, with at the beginning, um, where it mentioned that 1 million species are threatened with extinction. The report also tells us that it is not too late to make a difference, but only if we start now at every level from local to global and through transformative change, nature can still be conserved, restored, and used sustainably. So I would just like to applaud the Orchid Conservation Alliance and to all of the supporters of that organization uh, from local to global level who are doing those very things because I don't think that it's enough to simply be species rich when it comes to orchid conservation, but I think we can all agree that we are certainly richer for having those plants in our world. And we'd like to pass them on to the next generation.
I'd like to thank um, the National Science Foundation, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the University of Wisconsin, but most importantly, the Orchid Conservation Alliance for inviting me and also for all of its outstanding work around the world to help protect orchids. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. I think I'm there. All good. Thank you, Ken. That was really terrific. Um, great way to, to kick off the symposium. I really appreciate all the information and also the, the take home message at the end. Um, I personally have a bunch of questions. I don't know that we have time for all of those, um, but there was a couple of questions in the chat. So the first one from Bakta, uh, could you please tell us what is the percent success of DNA extraction from herbarium specimens? Oh, yeah, that's a practical question. Um, we had really excellent success. Um, the one reason for that, I think, is that we're in the temperate zone where um, you may know that in the tropics, um, bio biologists struggle with um, mold and fungi um, affecting plants that are collected. In other words, we can't dry them fast enough in the tropics. So oftentimes field botanists will um, douse their herbarium specimens with alcohol to keep fungi from growing on them. And that seems to denature the DNA. But here in the temperate zone in Wisconsin, we go out, um, a lot of the plants have thin leaves and we go right into a dryer and we, the DNA seems to preserve very well. Um, we also are not generally extracting specimens that are over a hundred years old. Many of these are only 10 or 20 years old. Um, and, um, However, I will say that certain families of plants, the orchids especially, are much more difficult to extract DNA from the herbarium specimens. But it still worked um, in our in our cases, so we were we were very lucky in that regard. There was probably only about mm, maybe fewer than fifty where we had no success at all, and we just went out into the field and collected those as fresh specimens. Right. But Thank the beauty you. of using the herbarium is, is all the specimens are vouchered. They've all been identified by specialists. Um, there's no ambiguity. Um, so it was just a, a perfect um, set of, a, a perfect resource right there at our fingertips. Yeah, that's really amazing. Out, out of curiosity, sort of following up on that a little bit, are there any other um, states in the U.S. or anywhere that you're aware of that are pursuing similar kinds of studies based on data sets that they might have available or herbarium collections they may have available? I know that um, Florida has done quite a bit of work out of the University of Florida. The last I heard was that they were mostly targeting every genus of plants in their state, but not necessarily down to the species level. Uh, the Canadians have also done quite a lot of this as well. Um, with this kind of DNA barcoding of their flora. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I was thinking a, a geo-referenced herbarium <clears throat> is not easy to achieve, but once you have it, there's so much you can do. Yeah, um, it's definitely an example of big data. Uh, second question, this is from uh, Peter Tobias. You talked about how species diversity and phylogenetic richness changed uh, are changing in Wisconsin. What if Wisconsin moves in the future toward the, probably to the Northwest. If you move Wisconsin to the Northwest, does that change the story at all? Yeah, so maybe that, that question might've come in before I got to the, the actual results I'm wondering. So our climate is, the envelope of our climate is essentially in a way moving toward the Northwest. I think I've seen simulations that say something like the current climate of St. Louis or Kansas City, Missouri today is what Wisconsin will feel like in the future. So, so that climate is shifting, which basically means that those Southern species will track that movement and come in, like I said, 850 new species coming in. But at the same time, the ones in the Northern tier, it's too warm for them. So they move out, they go up into Canada and persist. Um, one implication beyond orchids is agriculture, right? So, I mean, there's predictions of where will we be able to grow corn and soybeans, but more importantly for us, maple syrup industry, um, the maple syrup, uh, the, the sugar maple tree um, only can survive at 
kind of a certain latitude. We think of Vermont and New York State and Michigan and Wisconsin, um, but in the future it may be too warm and, and sugar maples will shift upward, making Canada the, the dominant provider of maple syrup. Um, which is a frightening thought to those of us who love maple syrup, especially from Vermont. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the last question uh, and I, that we'll have time for and then we'll just take a break is um, can you remind us how many genes did you use to do the uh, phylogeny? Oh, that's a two gene approach. Um, we use two small fragments. They're each about 600 base pairs long from the RBCL and the MATK gene. Those were um, determined by an international consortium who um, developed what we call the, um, the international barcode, the international plant barcode. So it's a it's a two gene barcode of DNA that um, can discriminate, hopefully all vascular plant species. The people who do barcoding of fungi or do barcoding of animals use different genes, but ours is a two gene RBCL mat K. Great, thank you. And then sort of as a follow up comment to that, this is from uh, Elsie. Um, inter inter very interesting collaborative efforts to try to bring together a lot of different data to and overlay those onto a map to evaluate what might happen in the future. Do you know if there are other groups that are doing similar collaborative kinds of projects in other parts of the world? Um, you know, um, I would say the Australians are some of the people who really led this effort. Um, Australia has its entire herbarium community um, digitized and databased. All the herbaria of, of Australia have have their specimens databased. And they were um, the first really to lead these really big efforts to look at species richness and phylogenetic diversity. Uh, so I know for sure Australia, parts of Europe, um, California is doing quite a bit of this. Um, I'm not so sure about South America or um, or Africa or, or parts of Asia, but but I think it's it's an, a new emerging area. And it, Elsie, I agree with you 100%. It, requires a team effort of expertise from many different areas. So it's it's really exciting. Well, thank you again very much, Ken. We have really enjoyed the talk and thank you for kicking us off. Uh, the, uh, the schedule shows that we take a five minute break. So why don't we go ahead and do that? It's uh, 10 o'clock in California right now. So we'll come back in five minutes with our next speaker. And thank you all. Thank you, bye. <laughs>